Yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord and thank you, Henry. And thank you for not only singing for us, but for setting up. And thank you, Ryan, for setting them up. Um, as you see, this stuff is hefty, so let's pray that there's been some invention for some lighter stuff. But thank you, God, for coming out here early, setting up. And thanks, Ryan, for helping us set up, get the generator going. That's, that's an appropriate song that leads us into a recap of, of the sermon series we're going to continue called Redeem, Restore, Rejoice. God, the building work in our lives from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an interesting and odd book in scripture. Not odd so much, but it's interesting in that I believe the reason Nehemiah existed and the reason this book was written is so that the Lord could reaffirm and reconfirm his tender, loving care. The fact that he continued to be the friend of his people because they felt, I believe in so many ways that though God had technically kept his promises to them, that though he had technically kept his word, that he really wasn't feeling them anymore. It's as if you're really, 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 really hurt by someone and, and, you're, and, and you're perhaps even, even crushed by them. And they might even come and say, I apologize, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, could, could you forgive me? And you, and you say, well, yeah, I will, I, I, because you know I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and I know that the Lord has forgiven me, so I'm gonna forgive you. But in our humanity, we're like, but I don't know if it's gonna ever be the same. I believe that's how God's people felt during the time of Nehemiah. That's what I'm going to do this brief recap, beginning with the reading of the passage from Nehemiah chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Echeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. It's an amazing report, not only, of course, because it was true, but the events that they spoke of, for which they still felt in great misery, distress, ridicule, scorn, and shame, happened about 140 years ago from the time of this report. And it beg, help us, helps us to beg the question, why are they still in such distress? That term, that they're in great shame and distress, in trouble, it brings to mind one who is living in misery and distress. And yet, technically speaking, God had kept his promise to his people. Yes, they had been conquered, no doubt. 586 BC, the Babylonian Empire swept through Judah, northern Judea, and then they completely decimated Jerusalem, rocking Solomon's temple to the ground. It was a traumatic, horrendous, horrific experience, and yet it was an experience that their great, great grand folks suffered, and they were still suffering the effects, but God had been faithful. He told them that, yes, you're going to be conquered, but 70 years after that, I'm going to bring you back to your land, and you're going to rebuild the temple, and that happened. 70 years after that, they were brought back from what was now the Medo-Persian Empire. They were brought back to Jerusalem, and they rebuilt the temple in 516 BC. So God had kept his promise. Furthermore, God sent them a wonderful man of God named Ezra. You read about Ezra in the book of Ezra, of course, but he also shows up in the book of Nehemiah. And Ezra helped them to get their theology straight. And yet, even 70 years after the rebuilding of the temple, when someone asked them, how's things back home? Listen again to their response. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. 
trauma, brokenness, is that fracturing of our soul, our being, our emotions, our, psych our psychology from something that has happened to us. And we're all subject to it living in a world cursed, marked, and marred by sin. Most of us have experienced something in our lives, something in our lives that has caused deep grief and pain. And with that deep grief and pain, it may have caused us to wonder about where we are with the Lord. All of us, because of the world we live in, suffer through either times or even prolonged times of deep distress and grief and a wondering if God is present, as our sister sang, if he's our friend, if we're really, really in good with him, or if he is simply because he's God and he has to keep his promises, he is keeping his promises because he's God. All of us have, well, I'll say I, at times have questioned the Lord's true love of me in my life. All of us have done things perhaps that's even contributed to our own misery. And we wonder, well, God, yes, technically I know you forgave me, but all this trouble that continues to happen in my life, is it because you were causing me to suffer the consequences of my own sin and of my own doing? And I believe here, this book of Nehemiah, so beautiful because the Lord answers the question of his people. He answers the cry of their heart by saying, yes, I still really do love you for real, for real. I'm not just saying it and I'm not playing. It. Yes, I'm still your friend. And yes, I'm going to comfort you. There are a few things we went over and because again, we want to get done by 11. I don't know what time it is. So I'm going to give me a time check. Minister, give me a time check. It's time to go. But I wanted to go over a few things um, as we continue this series. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be in Nehemiah 5, then we'll go up to Nehemiah 9, probably maybe 10. But I want us to remind us of a few things. One, we can still experience the effects of trauma and brokenness, even though the Lord has, in fact, rescued us, saved us from sin by faith in Jesus Christ. God, as I said, had rescued his people. He had kept his promise. His promises that they would come back to their land, be restored, rebuild the temple. The keeping of that promise, one could say, could have been confirmation enough that the Lord was still close with his people, that he had not actually abandoned them at all. But the same thing can happen with us. We can place our faith in Christ and still experience trouble, perhaps still even experience the after effects of trouble that has happened in our lives and wonder wonder if God is really close to us. Salvation, let me make, make this clear. Salvation erases sin. And what do I mean by that? Well, all of us have sinned. Sin is simply an insurrection against the living God. We're all familiar now, I'm pretty sure, with what an insurrection is, right? You know, we, I was talking to um, one of, I was talking to um, Zach Gray the other night um, when Marty and Chris Bay, they were in town look, looking at places and I was talking to him and he was saying how his teacher said that, yeah, they made us, we started talking about the insurrection because that was history. I said, yes, that's probably one of the most important historic events that you'll ever be a part of. An insurrection is when you try to overthrow a lawfully elected government by force. That's one way we can describe sin. Sin is when we turn away from God and try to meet our needs, gain our desires, heal our hurts by disobeying his ways, his word, and his will. And it's because of sin that we are not naturally connected with God. And in fact, God will judge us rightly for our sins with eternal damnation and punishment unless we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why we must place our faith in Jesus Christ. He is in that sense, the only way to have a right relationship with the living God. He lived a perfectly sinless life. That is, he did everything we were supposed to do 
to be right before God, but could never do on our own because we are never, we will never be morally perfect. We will always, in one way or the other, in one sense or another, whether in word, thought, or deed, we will always trip up, disobey the Lord, and we can never achieve that moral perfection. Christ did for us, and he gives it to us as a free gift. He then went to the cross. And at the cross, Christ died for all of our sins. Look at it this way. Imagine you were a part of the insurrection. I know none of y'all were there. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, imagine. I'm, he's like, this going over with Zoom. I'm, you know, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Y'all, you know, FBI ain't going to come knocking on your door. And if they do, we'll pray for you. <laughs> but imagine if you were part of the insurrection. And you were caught on camera. Walking through the Capitol building. And you were going to be convicted. And you were going to spend some real time in jail, as you should. And then someone who was not a part of it at, at all, someone who in fact has a clean, clear record before the government, says, I will take your penalty for it. That yes, you did do this crime. It's on camera. You were actually bragging about doing it. And yes, you should be convicted. You should spend time in jail. But I, out of my mercy and grace, I will take the punishment that you deserve. You go free, I take your punishment. That's what Christ did for us at the cross. At the cross, he absorbed the full fierce wrath, anger of the Father for our sin so we wouldn't have to. And the only thing we have to do to avoid that penalty and that punishment is to count that as true. To count as true, Christ lived a sinless life. To count as true, he went and on the cross, he died and sacrificed himself for our sins. And the account is true, he actually physically, bodily rose again from the grave and he is alive right now. And by rising again from the grave, he proved that the father accepted and approved of his sinless life. As our sister saying, we don't have to prove anything because Christ approves of us because in Christ, we are completely, completely blameless and guiltless. By rising again, Christ proved that the Father accepted his sacrificial death. And he proved that any and everybody who believes in him has eternal life. Amen and amen. Now, the salvation, of course, for the Jews back in the days of Nehemiah consisted of God's wonderful, miraculous work of bringing them back from captivity into their land. But let me be clear about something. Salvation doesn't erase trauma. Trust me, I know. It doesn't erase thoughts of misgivings before the Lord. It doesn't erase the pain. And because of that, I believe there is still things that we need to press into so that the effects of trauma don't consistently weigh us down and block our relationship with the Lord. So, of course, there was a salvation. Then I said he got their theology straight. By that, I mean he sent Ezra. Ezra was a man committed to teaching the word of God clearly and rightly. And it's important for our walk and growth in the Lord that we are taught the word of God clearly and rightly so that we can know who God is, know what he's done for us in Christ, know how that impacts and affects our lives and grow in it in such a way that we have vital, vibrant Christian lives. That we actually begin by the grace of God to live the abundant life that Christ said is ours in him. And we need to have a right understanding of God, his word, his will, his ways, so that we can do that well and fruitfully and joyfully. As I said, one of my new sayings, I'm going back to Pastor Paul Shepherd. Um, when I used to, when he was my assistant pastor at West Oak Lane Church of God, he said, look, if you're going to be saved, it's better to be saved and glad than saved and mad. It is. Let's face it, it's better to be saved and glad than saved and mad. What, why are some folks, we always walk around mad. What are we walk around mad for? We're saved. Now, I, I, I will put this caveat on it. As, as one brother once said, well, it is better to be saved and mad and not saved at all. I get that. But if you are going to be saved, it really is better to be saved and glad. I'm not saying that we put on a happy face and not act like life doesn't happen. But in general, by the grace of God, we can have a vital vibrant walk before the Lord in such a way that we can indeed enjoy all aspects of the life 
that we have being created in God's image and then being redeemed by Jesus Christ. But again, their salvation and getting their theology straight, it still didn't erase the feeling of misery, distress, scorn, and ridicule. When Nehemiah asked, how are things back home? They didn't say, well, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We got our temple built and we're worshiping the Lord and that's going all right. Yeah, we don't like things about the government because it's not our government. It's not a king. There's not a descendant of David on the throne. There's this cat named Artaxerxes. He's not circumcised. He doesn't worship Yahweh exclusively, but by the grace of God, we're protected. The Medo-Persian Empire is at the height of its power. We have no threat. We can worship the Lord the way we want to worship the Lord. We can obey all of our cultural practices. We have our heritage. We are an intact people. God is good. Let's sit down, have some food, and keep talking about the goodness of the Lord. They didn't say that. In fact, they answered the opposite. And that's why I wanted to preach through this book. Because in so many ways, I believe our society has even experienced a shaking. Now, not everybody felt it. For example, how many of y'all felt the earthquake? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. I was in his house when it happened, I think. I don't know if, I, if we were still, and I didn't feel it. My wife felt it. My nephew felt it. But my sister Dawn didn't feel it. Many of y'all didn't feel it, but I think almost everyone in our society felt the trauma of this past year, year and a half. We've had to deal with the pandemic. We've had to deal with the increasing racial strife, tension and hostility. And again, the church, we cannot just bury our head in the sands and say, well, let's just like teach the Bible and ignore these issues. No, because God speaks to all of them. Amen. And so by the grace of God, we've walked through this book a little bit and the sermons are on the website. And if you want an outline of any of the messages, please let me know. But even though God had kept his promise and given them salvation, even though God had in his goodness sent them and straightened out their theology, because he still knew that this is how they felt, dear ones, he raised up Nehemiah, whose name means God has comforted. Now that's kind of uncanny to me. That there's this young man born a hundred and I don't know, 10 or so years after the traumatic events of 586 BC. He's raised in the Medo-Persian Empire. I don't know if prior to that time he had even, even been to Jerusalem. God gives him gifts talents and skills and experience and he raises to one of he rises to one of the most important positions in the entire empire he is the cup bearer to the king that is he tastes the king's wine to make sure it's not poisoned that means that basically if it is poison and it acts right away the king would know because nehemiah would drop dead that's kind of how that job worked that was on the application we need somebody with a little bit of courage because guess what you might just decide to drop dead. That means that might happen because I'm the emperor, folks trying to get me. That's how it was back then. God raised him up. His parents, out of their own volition, called him Nehemiah, meaning God is comforted. And this man who was raised up, who was in a position to connect directly with the king, has a heart for his people. And he asks how they're doing. And when he gets a response, he immediately knows why he exists and what God has for him. And the fact that God is going to use him to bring comfort to his people. And I close with this because in that way, in so many ways, Nehemiah is like Christ. Christ is the one who ultimately comforts us. Why? A couple reasons. One, Christ says that no matter what we have done, to mess up our own lives and bring trauma in our own lives, no matter what regrets we have, he comforts us by rescuing us and redeeming us from sin. He does that. He doesn't hold it against us. 
He doesn't say, well, yeah, you did this and maybe you should suffer this way. No, he says, I'm going to erase your sin and then comfort you in the trauma of your sin so that you don't have to live with that regret the rest of your life. And Christ did that by becoming an object of ridicule, by becoming an object of scorn, knowingly, on purpose, because he wanted to. When was the last time you were embarrassed? Let me think of a time you were embarrassed. I remember growing up and we didn't have a lot of money. And my mother would go to the Sears basement. Some of you remember what Sears was, if you don't, Google it. And she would look through the basement bin of sneakers that were two for five dollars. And she'd be looking through that bin and I was just so angry because I knew that I had to wear these sneakers to the Little League game and I was going to be embarrassed because so they go Bobo Lance again with his Bobos because I couldn't get Chuck Taylors or Keds. When was the last time you were embarrassed when you wanted nothing and no one to see you at all? How did that feel? Weren't you thankful when it was over? Christ walked in to being scorned, ridiculed, mocked for us. And what we have found through this book of Nehemiah is what the Lord does to meet us at that point of our trauma and our brokenness to say he loves us he cares about us and what happened to us. And if we can bring it all to him, whatever has happened, whatever we face, however it's affected us, we don't have to live in it. There is redemption. There is restoration. And we can rejoice in the Lord that we can experience it now. So by the grace of God, we're going to continue in this book and close it out. Again, I would encourage you to look past some. If you want to get more information about what I preach, look at some of the other sermons about it. I'll put that up on our Facebook page. But just know, whatever it is, however it is, the Lord not only redeems, but he restores. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning with gratitude you are as one who is compassionate and gracious and good enough so good in fact that you sent your one and unique son Jesus Christ who walked into misery and distress and trouble and ridicule and mocking so that he could redeem us from our sins and he can begin his work through the power of the spirit of healing us from our trauma so that we might live abundant lives in you. Help us to follow the pathway even of this book of Nehemiah that we might see you do wondrous works in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name.